Welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast, your go-to source for personal, professional, and organizational growth and development. We hope you tune in often for all things people management, organizational development and change, organizational leadership, and social impact related. Maximize your personal and organizational potential with Human Capital Innovations Podcast. Welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. In this HCI podcast episode, I talk with Minna Taylor about the role of confidence in employee performance. Mina Taylor, welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. Oh, hi, Jonathan. Thank you. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be with you today. And uh, this has been a long time coming. We've had to reschedule a couple of times due to various scheduling conflicts. And even this morning, we were having some technical technical difficulties. So it's been a an adventure, to say the least, to get things rolling. But it's a pleasure to be with you. I'm super excited to have this conversation. Today, we're going to be talking about the role that confidence plays in performance and really what we can do to bolster confidence and sustain it in a healthy way. As we get started, I wanted to share Mina's bio with everybody. Mina Taylor is the founder of Energize Your Voice, a New York City-based communication coaching and training firm. With an experiential approach rooted in the principles of play and performance, she and her team support organizations, individuals, and entrepreneurs to explore their full potential in public speaking, storytelling, and leadership communication. They have many notable clients. She has an an MFA in performance with a concentration in speech and vocal production. Beginning her career as an accent reduction specialist, Mina went on to transfer her theater training to develop an innovative approach for professional development. Again, it's a pleasure to have you, Mina. Anything else you would like to share with listeners by way of your background or personal context before we dive on into the conversation? I think the important thing to note, and please excuse the siren, I'm in Brooklyn. Um, The important thing to note, I think with all this context is that I trained as an actress. I have my master's degree in acting. And so my entire approach, my entire philosophy really comes from play and the body. That's how I was trained. That's how I've sort of integrated and embodied all the things that I learned. And that's ultimately what I try to impart on my students and clients. So um, that that should give people a little bit of context around who they're working with, a a, a former actors turned uh, founder and business business owner. Yeah, let's start then with uh, a little bit about your background uh, in performance leading to uh, your your work in terms of communication coaching and training. Tell us maybe a little bit about that connection um, and how you made that transition. And then we can get into more specifics about the role of confidence and, and uh, how that leads to better sustainable employee performance. Yeah, absolutely. When we think about acting, acting at its core essence is truth telling with strategy. So all acting is, is standing bravely, standing still, looking straight and telling the truth. That's it. And so if we then think about all that's entailed there, uh, training as an actress, that's really about undoing habits that you've learned as a kid, you know, undoing habits that we've learned through different patterns of behavior and interaction around relationship, uh, and then really coming back into a neutral body. So that when met with a challenging moment and in acting, there are a ton of them, right? We love drama. Uh, How do we still show up in that moment presently prepared to rise to the occasion and prepared to be adaptable and listening and playful and responsive to what's going on in front of us? And so that's how I trained. I trained with uh, the Atlantic Theater Company in New York. And I trained with Edith Skinner, Speak With Distinction, and Chuck Jones, Voice Work. And it was really all about the body. How do I show up? How do I say the lines? But ultimately, how do I pursue an objective? How do I do that truthfully? And how do I do it with a deep level of strategy and intentionality? And so based on that description, you can absolutely intuit how that would support teams. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And being an effective communicator is 
such an important piece of leadership. It's such an important piece of uh, successful team development and growth. And ultimately, leadership and team building is all about mutual, mutual accountability and trust. And so you have to be able to come and be with someone and be there presently, be attuned, you have to uh, commit to the relationships you're in, and you have to uh, learn to develop that trust with each other through like you were saying, truth telling, just being authentic, right. And yeah. ultimately, that's, that's so key. Well, that's wonderful. Well, what, what I love about it, Jonathan, the way the way that I try to explain it to people is, in acting, we work on plays. We learn to play. That is literally what we're doing. And so what we also do, not only do we learn how to play fully, we learn how to play well with others, <laughs> right? So that's exactly what you're talking about. We learn how to play well with others. That is what I'm trained in and that is what I teach. Yeah, that's wonderful. So let's talk a little bit now about confidence. Now, clearly in performance, you need to have confidence. You're up on stage, you're up, you know, in front of people. Uh, and and public speaking is one of those things that, you know, consistently comes up in the list, you know, the people's top fears. And so clearly uh, it requires confidence to perform in that way. How does that translate over into the workplace? And now we're talking about employee performance. We're talking about team interactions and team performance. What role does confidence play in that kind of a setting? You know, it's interesting, uh, even in that question, I am going to pose a redefinition. And so when you're talking, you're saying, how do you feel confident when you're confident on stage? And so here's the entire premise of my work. And this is what I'm writing about in my book. This is what I teach in my group coaching course, which is confidence is not something you are. It is not something you're seeking to become. It is something that's perceived by others. What we ultimately are perceiving when we see confidence is a body that is open and available to breath, connected breath, a body that is open to physical and vocal expression, a body that is living right on the precipice of risk and failure, but somehow manages to keep it all together. And that's that sort of intangible space of aliveness and play. That is what we perceive when we perceive confidence. So we are not seeking confidence. We are seeking open body, open breath, and freedom of voice with the condition of play. So now we say, okay, how does that translate into the workplace? Well, that allows me to listen more deeply. That allows me to stay adaptable and agile. That allows me to engage in deeply authentic, co-created conversations with my, uh, with my leaders, with my team members, with people with whom we are trying to create new ideas for innovation and product design. When we are existing in these confident behaviors, we will have deeper levels of influence. We will embed deeper layers of trust and ultimately what will come out of that are stronger relationships that are moving toward a shared objective. So that's why confidence matters in the workplace. Yeah. And I, I like that framing. Um, so thank you for that. And yeah, the perception is so essential. Maybe one thing we can touch on really quickly is, is faux confidence. And maybe given the definition you just provided, maybe we have to, I even have to reframe the question. I'm trying to think about uh, how, how to go about it, but we all know people who convey this kind of false sense of confidence, right? And it's, they're blustery, they're puffing out their chest, they're, they're trying to fill the room with, with this confidence, but they're not actually confident. People can see through that. Um, so I'm wondering what you think about that. And because it is perception, like I, I can tell if someone is exuding, you know, this, this sense of confidence and it's authentic versus, you know, when it's, it's really just fake and it's, it's a facade. Um, so how, how does that fit with your definition? Yeah, really beautiful distinction there. And so first of all, I want to really have deep sensitivity. The fact that the way I'm uh, promoting to redefine this entire conversation around confidence, not only with us, but just sort of at large requires a bit of a paradigm shift because it's a word that's used ubiquitously, but we are often neglect to define it in specific actionable, functional, integratable terms. 
And so that's really what I'm seeking to do here. So using the word confidence in, in conversation, and I do it also, is not necessarily talking about confidence itself, right? So we have to sort of distinguish them different from behavior versus how we are defining our circumstances, very different things. So as we're thinking about it with behavior, what you're expressing here is the experience of arrogance. So when arrogance and confidence are really close neighbors, when we shift into the space of arrogance, we are no longer working authentically. We're no longer working to connect. We're looking either to protect or assert. And so even we can feel this subtle distinction in the energy, right? If I'm arrogant, I'm not available to listening because I'm putting too much out or I'm overly tense in the body. So I cannot receive you, right? I am now protecting myself and I am also, so I'm protecting myself and resisting connection. Whereas confidence, we are not tense. We are soft in our body. We're prepared, we're activated right? But we're not tense in our body, which means I can now receive you because my breath is open. So I'm literally inhaling. I'm getting inspiration from you and I'm open and available to that. An arrogant person, you will not have that same experience, although they may come off as credible and capable and intelligent and lots of cool ideas, but you will feel a disconnect from being able to really penetrate them as on this human to human connection level. Check out our new weekly LinkedIn newsletter, Alchemizing Human Capital, exploring industry trends via original research and interviews with executives and thought leaders from across the globe. We look forward to having you join us. Bluer Than Indigo Leadership, the journey of becoming a truly remarkable leader. Early in my adult life, I learned about an Asian proverb that translates as bluer than indigo. If you think about the color indigo, it is a brilliant, deep, and vibrant blue, what some would call the bluest of blues. To have something that is bluer than indigo is rare and truly remarkable. Contrary to popular myth, there is no one-size-fits-all or cookie-cutter approach to effective leadership. There is no silver bullet, no secret sauce, no go-to model that will solve all of your problems. The truth is, great leaders have all had their unique strengths and flaws, and have all had to discover and then pave their own distinctive path in their life's journey to fulfill their leadership potential. Bluer Than Indigo Leadership will help you discover your own path and explore those ordinary, everyday actions that will help you respond to an uncertain future and produce extraordinary results for your individuals, teams, and organizations. Yeah, I, I like that. And that that connection is so essential. It is, it's something that can't be faked. And, and so you have, like, I, I was thinking about someone just the other day, I was thinking about someone who's a very accomplished person, um, you know, very credible, very intelligent. Uh, many people look to them as a really great leader. And yet my interactions with this person and the close interactions of, of many around me, uh, who, who, uh, who really are in the same space, feel like she's constantly just looking past or looking through you when she's talking to you. So she conveys a great sense of, of you know, using kind of a different, my other definition of confidence, she, she conveys that kind of that power and control and she conveys this, this, and she asserts this, this kind of comp, this kind of, uh, I keep on wanting to say the word confidence. She keeps asserting, you know, herself and, there's no actual connection, right? It, it's just a matter of, of this, this real sense that she's talking through you, talking at you, not really mm. seeing you, not really being with you. And so whatever that kind of faux confidence is, it's not working um, because it's, it's, it's not creating a meaningful relationship, uh, a collaborative and reciprocal relationship it's it's rather it, as essentially it's kind of dismissive and and putting down even if that's not her intention right and and i i believe that you know her intentions are probably good and that she's doing the best she knows how but this is this is a a common thing that i've seen in other leaders as well and so you know it, it's it's important to to really strive for that connection and, and, and where we can bring compassion in here jonathan when we experience 
arrogance, which sometimes makes us feel defensive or resentful or, you know, judgmental when we experience someone that's arrogant or even confused or a little unsettled. If we can bring in compassion here, again, confidence is for connecting. Arrogance is for protecting. It's not for you know, um, uh, attacking, it's not, it's literally about self-protection. So there are behaviors that are developed in a way that is overly assertive because there is underlying insecurity. And so if we can think about it from that perspective, that doesn't mean we gotta like it, right? But it does allow for that little layer of compassion, which ultimately is the thing that you are in control of, right? You cannot control the behavior patterns of others, but you can control the way in which you are triggered or engaged with your circumstances. And that allows you to maintain confident behavior, even when you're experiencing or in the presence of somebody who is witnessing or um, demonstrating arrogant behavior. And I think you can also reflect this on Amy Cuddy's research, right? So this idea of the power posture and the moving into this power pose stance. Um, how I think about this is when, when people, why rather, people tend to maybe demonstrate arrogance on this initial pathway to the journey, because this idea of power posture is a layered on. So it's, I call it like cloaking yourself in, a, in an idea of confidence. So now you're walking around in this facade of someone you think you should be, or looking like someone you think people want you to be like, hey, I'm a woman. I'm in a leadership position. That means I have to be strong. I have to assert my voice. I have to interject. So think about the behaviors that are now developed as a result of that, as opposed to, right? So as opposed to going into this power posture, big, bold, potentially tense, overly exerted, we're doing too much. I say do less to allow for more. So when we're thinking about this notion of confidence, it can be simple. It can be still. And it can be silent. I love that. I love it. Um, that's that's a really great way to to interpret those interactions. And I like I like trying to have a compassionate uh, approach to these interactions because we're all just fumbling around in this world trying to do the best know. we know how, and we all mess up all the time and put our foot in our mouth or do things that are less productive. We are but, inherently fallible. There is no way yes. around it. Yes. Well, so maybe in, in the last few minutes we have together today, we can talk a little bit more about what leaders can do to inspire confidence in their teams and themselves. I think the biggest thing that's, well, well there are two things. So one is, uh, listen, really embed listening versus responding as a primary driver, especially on Zoom, especially on the in these virtual landscapes, it can feel really challenging to make your voice heard, to get in there. So you may be ready to just hit the unmute button. Hey, you got something to say. Hey, you got something to say. And, and so really empowering people that listening is gonna be the driving behavior around communication moving forward is not only gonna make things feel a lot more tangible in terms of results, right? Oh, I actually heard you. So now I actually know what I'm supposed to do and I know what you're doing and how we're working together on this. Amazing. We were patient enough in our listening to create established agreements and expectations and next steps. Huzzah. So that's the one thing, right? So listen, listen, listen. Um, I like the, you know, some things that none of this is novel. It's not new information, right? So we've got the two ears, one mouth, use them in that ratio, right? Um, so listen, listen, listen. The other thing leaders need to do is facilitate connection. That doesn't mean all the Zoom happy hours. That doesn't mean making sure that like you have these special events. It, what that means is, hey, everyone, we're in this meeting. Here's how it's going to go. I'm just going to start by five minutes. And then here's how I want to give each of you an opportunity to participate if you want to. We're going to turn ourselves off mute or we're going to do an emoji hand raise or just pop it into the chat. But I want to give you this really clear permission where you can sit in absolute um, comfort in your listening knowing that I have now established that you will all have a space to share your voice. And if those two things are present, people will feel more at ease, less urgent, and more open to working together holistically, as opposed to feel like it's me against you for who gets the most airtime. 
Yeah. Yeah. I like that. Mina, it has been a pleasure. I know at the time I'm going to have to let you go here in just a minute. Uh, we could go on and on and on because we've really just scratched the surface and there's so many great things to to unpack here. But for today, we're going to have to finish the conversation. Uh, before we close, I wanted to give you a chance to share with listeners how they can get connected with you, find out more about your work, and then give us a final word on the topic for today. Yeah, I uh, follow me on Instagram. That's the best point of contact. It's at Minute Taylor underscore EYV. Uh, and then you can also go to my website, which is just minutetaylor.com. And why I'm directing you there as opposed to energize your voice is because we are launching our Confident Body course, which is our group coaching course around the book, the Confident Body book, which will be released in May. So if I'm, if you go to minutetaylor.com, you can get all the information in terms of when that book will be released in both soft cover and ebook and when the, uh, registration for that course is complete. So you'll get notifications around all of that stuff. Final word on confidence is speaking should be as easy as breathing. So make sure that your body is open to breath. I love it. Thank you, Minna. It's been a real pleasure talking with you today. I encourage listeners to reach out, get connected, find out more about what Minna can do for you. And as always, I hope everyone can stay healthy and safe, that you can find meaning and purpose at work each and every day. And I hope you all have a great week. The alchemy of truly remarkable leadership, ordinary everyday actions that produce extraordinary results. Consider how the nature of work has shifted over the past 50 years. With increased globalization, rapid technological advancement, and the shift in economic composition, the average job of today looks very different than the average job of 50 years ago. What will the jobs and organizations of tomorrow look like? Moreover, what does this all mean for organizational leaders? What are the core competencies and capabilities of organizations and their leadership that are prepared for continued disruption and geopolitical and socioeconomic shifts? Regardless of what the future holds, increasingly, leaders need to be socially minded, data driven, decisive, champions of talent, and disruptors of the traditional notions of leadership, teams, organizations, and work. The alchemy of truly remarkable leadership will help you to explore your own leadership competencies and capabilities and consider ways to apply and implement them into your workplace and personal life. Check out Human Capital Innovations magazine, Human Capital Leadership. Human Capital Leadership is a free interactive e-magazine with the mission to help individuals, leaders, and organizations find innovative approaches to maximize their human capital potential. We publish issues quarterly in August, November, February, and May. Take a look at the latest issue and let us know what you think. Thanks again for joining us for this episode of the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. I hope you stay healthy and safe and that you have a great week.